Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Father, that you are calling us higher, that you are calling us into a whole new dimension, a whole new realm of who you are. And, Father, we thank you for your anointing, for your grace, for your power, for your presence. And, God, we pray that even tonight that there would be a release of that higher place within us. So we thank you, we give you this service, and we ask that your purposes would be accomplished. We bind every spirit, every assault, every assignment of the enemy against this time together. And we ask in all that is done and all that we do that you would be glorified and your purposes would be accomplished in Jesus' name. And if you agree, would you say amen? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. That was a wonderful song of the Lord that Apostle James brought tonight. And I believe it is the heart of God uh, because tonight the name of the message is Prophets Arise. And I believe that God is is not only calling us to a higher place, there's more for us to see, there's more for us to to do, there's more for us to uh, be able to reveal and to be revealed to us. God did never called us to be wanderers or wilderness walkers. He never, ever did. And so because of that, You know, we want to stay in alignment with what he's doing and what he's saying. Now, we know that in this, I'm going to start with some teaching and then I'm going to talk about prophets and how they operate, how they function, some of the, um, some of the areas in which prophets operate. But we know that uh, Christ has set in his church five what we call ascension gifts or five-fold ministry gifts, the prophets, apostles, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. We know that he set them in the church because why? The church needed them, right? We need those ascension gifts. Uh, Each one carries a different level of anointing, a different grace upon them, and all five are equally important. We have the apostle who they are architects and builders, have a fathering spirit upon them. The evangelist that uh, leads the lost to Christ and, and reminds us of the importance of, of saving the lost. Um, the pastors who counsel and nurture and who bring forth uh, comfort to God's people. Uh, the teachers that instruct and, and re- root people in God's word. And, and explained his word and his ways, and then the prophet that brings God's voice of direction, uh, his, his guidance, his revelation, his declaration, edification, exhortation, and comfort. And we know that all five are necessary and that they add uh, to the equipping of every believer in the church of Jesus Christ. Now, there are different operations of the prophetic. And if you've gone through any of our schools, you know that, that we, we teach a lot in our prophetic schools about the different types of prophetic operations. And one that I'm sure you're familiar with is the um, prophetic uh, utterance by activation. And activation uh, works by faith and by obedience. In 1 Corinthians 14, 31, it says, For you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. 
um, the activation anointing moves uh, the faith of the individual to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them. It's not an office or a gift, but it's an anointing arising within the believer, and they exercise their faith to be a voice for him and to allow him to use them for uh, giving uh, prophetic utterances. Uh, Romans 12, 6 says we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. And if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to the measure of his faith. In other words, we will only hear and reveal the voice of God based upon the level of the faith that we have to do so. The second operation is the spirit of prophecy, and we see that operating oftentimes uh, in a number of circumstances. The way that we mostly see it is when there is a, a powerful presence that permeates a service, making it easy to hear God's voice, making it easy to prophesy. And when you're in a service like that, you may even be in a situation where, you know, someone that you don't expect to prophesy all of a sudden comes up to the front and they've got a prophetic word of the Lord. Uh, another way in which the spirit of prophecy manifests is when people come among a company of prophets and there's an anointing, there's a mantle, there's a release of impartation that enables people to uh, begin to hear more clearly. It's, we see that in the scripture when Saul came among the school of the prophets and the sons of the prophets and they said, oh, is Saul a prophet also? And uh, then thirdly, when people are challenged to let God arise within them and testify through them by the spirit of prophecy. At those times when that anointing, when that grace is present, the spirit of prophecy is present, anybody can prophesy. And any born-again believer can also hear the voice of the Lord and receive and give a prophetic word by, word by faith and obedience. The next level is the gift of prophecy, which is a gift given uh, by the Holy Spirit. It's one of the nine manifestations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are outlined in 1 Corinthians 12. And we see that in Acts 2, 17, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams. And we are in a day when the, the outpouring of that ability and that anointing and grace to be able to hear and to release really is upon the church of Jesus Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit gives the gifts. We see those gifts outlined in 1 Corinthians 12. And there are nine. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, it says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So uh, Paul was exhorting the church that they would, that people would not only hear, but they would also release the word that the Lord shows them or the, the word that the Lord gives them. And there's a reason for that. And he says it in 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He said, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. In other words, prophecy is a building ministry. It helps to build up, edify the church. And we have to be faithful to use those gifts. In 1 Peter 4.10, uh, we're exhorted, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as what? Good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, the, the gift of prophecy flows in edification, exhortation, and comfort. The other manifestation is the office of the prophet. And we see that the prophet's ministry is foundational to the church. 
in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. It says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. Now, it is an office that is given by Christ himself as a gift to the church. <clears throat> the gift of prophecy is a gift given by the Holy Spirit. But the, the actual office of the prophet is a gift from Jesus Christ to the church. It says in Ephesians 4, 7 and 2, 11, it says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says... When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Going down to uh, verse 11, it says, And he himself gave some to be prophets, some, uh, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then it goes further, and it says, until, say until, we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. So as we can see, these five-fold ministry gifts are still very, very needed in the church. We've got a little ways to go. Would you agree with that? Yes. yes, I would too. Jesus, of course, was the full manifestation of all five offices. And prophets flow in not only edification, exhortation, comfort, but in addition, guidance, instruction, direction, revelation, declaration, judgment, correction, perceiving, and proclaiming. And they are an extension of Christ to the church in order to give alignment and proper structure to the building of the church. Now, I say all that to give you just a basic understanding, and many of you are, are familiar with this, about the different operations of the prophetic. But let me tell you, God is calling us to a higher level. He's calling particularly his prophets, but he's calling all who operate in the gift of prophecy, all who desire to not only hear but to proclaim his voice, to come up to a higher level. There's a different realm, a different uh, uh, dimension that God wants to lift us up into so that we can see not only what he is doing, but what he is uh, coming with in the days ahead. And so I want to talk about ways prophets operate, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, by no means an exhaustive um, uh, measure of all that prophets are to give or to do within the church. But I want to present it to you as a prophetic people, and especially if you are called to the office of the prophet or have a prophetic gift or you don't know. Uh, you think, you know, you don't know if you're called to the office. I want to challenge you to begin thinking higher. And so think about these ways in which God uses prophets in his church and begin to challenge yourself to rise to a new level. Now, one of the ways that God uses prophets and prophetic people and the gift of prophecy is in personal prophecy. Personal prophecy is a word given through a, a born-again a uh, faith-filled believer who extends her faith to hear God and release that word over an individual. What is uh, 
important about that is that it helps identify giftings and callings. It can bring answers. It, it's very edifying to the body. It helps identify oftentimes your membership ministry in the body of Christ. But we don't want to stop there. We don't want to just stay on that, that level of releasing the word of the Lord. It's important and it's needed, but there's more for us if we will seek him for it. One of the ways that uh, God uses prophets and that they operate is they announce the greater plans and purposes of God. The things that are to come. Matthew 3.3 3 says, For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That is a prophetic utterance to prepare a people for the return of the Lord. That is part of our call. We know that in Amos 3, 7, a very prophetic scripture, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. He does reveal uh, these things, and it is important that we seek him for those greater things to come. God, what are you doing in our city? What are you doing in the educational system? What are you doing in the government? What are you doing in the families? What are you doing in our church? You know, if we do not ask and, and ask the Lord, then we won't have and, and won't be uh, as open to receive what it is that he wants to release in this hour. Another key for prophets and how they operate is they turn people's hearts from sin to righteousness. In Jeremiah 23, 21 and 22, this was, this was the Lord talking to Jeremiah. And he was saying, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, and yet they prophesied. He says, but if they had stood in my counsel and caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from their evil of their doings. In other words, he was saying, okay, I didn't speak to those guys that were prophesying, but if they had come and stood in my counsel then they would have known what to do in order to help the people hear my words and turn from their evil ways. Prophets help turn people to righteousness. Another is they turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. In Malachi 4, 5, and 6, says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. In other words, the prophetic word can bring a revelation of linking, of relationship of even uh, um, destiny links that are to be. It can mend, it can reconcile, it can cause uh, uh, the bonding that God desires to link between churches, between people, between families, between cities. I mean, God can do that uh, through the prophetic word, and, and it starts with turning the hearts of the, the fathers uh, to the children and the children to the fathers. Another key is prophets encourage apostles in the building of the kingdom. We see in Ezra chapter 5 when they were, when they were building uh, and rebuilding in uh, Jerusalem, 
it says, Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Idu, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, and Jeshua, son of Jozadak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were there with them, helping them. You see, pioneering is hard work. It is very hard. And the devil is, he still has his favorite things to say to us. And one of the big ones is, hath God said? Hath God really said? And when you're pioneering, there's always resistance. When you're building, there's always resistance. The enemy does not want the church. He does not want you. He does not want whatever you are laboring in for the kingdom's sake. He does not want it to build or advance. And so he's always putting up those oppositions. And, and the enemy's right there going, hath God really told you to do this? Are you really supposed to build that ministry? Are you really supposed to do what you've got your hands on doing? And prophets help encourage because they deliver the word of the Lord at a critical key time when uh, the enemy has tried to slow down or stop or delay. We see further in Ezra 6.14, it says, So the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Idu. And they built and they finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, king of Persia. You see, that apostles have an enduring breakthrough and breaker anointing, but yet they can be discouraged, and they can get uh, they can get under the opposition that comes against them. Prophets number five: prophets deal with spiritual structures and the spirits supporting demonic structures. In Jeremiah 1.10, we see God describing to Jeremiah what he had called him to do. He says, see, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, and to build and to plant. And he, he was saying that you're to root out what is not supposed to be there, identify it and root it out, tear down what the enemy has built, the oppositions and the things of that nature. You are to destroy all assaults against my plan and purposes, throw it to the ground, and then plant my vision, my purposes, and build. Amen? That's, that's good stuff. Let's thank God for that. So they deal with spiritual structures. So, you know, there are structures that are set in place over cities, over territories, over systems, over the educational system, over the governmental system. You can look at the seven mountains of culture, which I think we all know, but they are the, uh, the mountain of business, the mountain of arts and entertainment, the mountain of education, the mountain of media, the mountain of religion, the mountain of family, and the mountain mountain of government. And those are the seven mountains that represent and make up our culture. And let me tell you, at every high place, the enemy wants to set up his own high place. 
And so as a, as a prophetic people, as prophets, we are, to, we are to speak what God is saying into those structures. Let me tell you, there is power and anointing in the voice of the Lord. The scripture says the voice of the Lord shakes the cedars. You know, he, he, it can break down opposition. Let me tell you, if every prophetic person in this city began to speak uh, what God is saying over the city of Atlanta, we would see a turnaround in 30 days. I'm serious because the enemy would scatter so many ways because of the plans and purposes of God being decreed, being prayed, being proclaimed, being declared, you know, and the angels hearken to the word of the Lord. They begin to drive out, begin to, to sift through, begin to clean out, clean up, clear out. And next thing you know, you've got people who have been under those influences of those structures going, what was I thinking? What, have, what was I doing? Why do I think it's okay to teach six-year-old children about transgenderism? Do you hear what I'm saying? I mean, there's a veil over many well-meaning children-loving people in that system, and they think they're doing right, but they're doing, they're so misguided and so deceived that, you know, they don't even, they don't even know what's up and what's down. And so as prophets and as a prophetic people, we need to look and see what the Lord is saying to these structures. Prophets help direct leaders through prophecy, prophetic insight, dream interpretation, and heavenly wisdom. We see that throughout. In fact, as a model, the kings in the Old Testament all had either a seer or a prophet, which was the same, because those who were once called seers are now called prophets, Scripture tells us. So they all had that voice to help keep them on track help them be guided in what God was, was having them to do. <clears throat> A good example is in Genesis 41, 25 through 44, when Pharaoh had the dream and Joseph was saying, what is, I mean, and Pharaoh was saying, what does this dream mean, you know? And Joseph said, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. And he began to give him a prophetic interpretation of the dream that God had given Pharaoh. And then he gave uh, Joseph the wisdom to know how to, uh, the strategy, how to overcome what was about to come. Another way in which prophets operate, prophets preserve and they protect. You know, in, in many churches, people think that the pastor is the one that's supposed to guard and protect the sheep, but prophets have a key role in helping to be a spiritual guardian in the church, within the church. And they protect, they discern, they see, they hear God, they, they hear where traps have been laid, and they can warn and they can uh, pray and decree and expose. I mean, it's, it's very, very important. And we see that uh, the word preserve means to keep from harm, damage, danger, or evil. It can also mean to protect and save. And in Hebrew, that word is shamar. And shamar means to hedge about as with thorns, to guard and to protect and to watch and to keep. And we see in Hosea 12, 13, it says, And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he preserved. And we can also see it in the life of Samuel. 
1 Samuel 7, 13 says, So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Now, Samuel was a, a very well-known prophet uh, in the Old Testament, and he, uh, the books of Samuel are about his life and his presence. But it also gives a, a good example and a good picture of the power of the presence of a prophet who is operating in their authority and protecting. And the enemy hates prophets because the prophets, even by their presence, can help thwart the enemy's advances. And that's why the enemy has done everything he can uh, to try and keep prophets from being recognized and operational in the local church. Because he traffics in darkness. He doesn't like to be exposed. And when he is exposed, then his plans are up. Right? Because then we can deal with them, we can tear them down, root them out, all of that. <clears throat> the next point is that prophets deal and expose religious spirits and traditions of men. In Matthew 3, 7, and 10, we see John the Baptist, and it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, he said to them, now, we teach it, you know, how to deliver a little differently than maybe John the Baptist did. He says, you brood of vipers, <clears throat> who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance and don't think to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. You know, many times people have a religious camp or a religious move of God, not a religious move of God, a move of God that at one time had God's real anointing and power and thrust behind it. And then they got around that truth. They, they began to speak that truth, live that truth, and all of that. And that was wonderful. But then God continues to grow and to move and to advance. He doesn't stay there. And when, when people stay in the old move of God, it becomes a form. And it can become a religious tradition. And it can become, you know, it, it can become where things are just done as a matter of form, but the anointing and the true presence of God has, has already moved to a different place. And oftentimes it is that move that will persecute the new move. And, you know, that is, that is not good. So when John the Baptist was saying this, he was saying, don't say you have Abraham as your father. Now, there was a time that was, that was the key, you know, if you were a child of Abraham. He says, for I say to you that God's able to raise up children to Abraham from these rocks. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. In other words, don't just stand on your, your old religious tradition. Go where the cloud is. Go where the cloud is, where the presence of God is, where the presence of God is moving, where there is a life-giving flow of Holy Spirit. Prophets are intercessors. You will not find a prophet who is um, effective in really hearing accurately and staying accurate and, uh, and getting the revelation from God if they don't pray. And they are intercessors. And we see... In Jeremiah 27, 18, it says, 
uh, and God was talking about the prophets. He said, but if they are prophets, and if the, the word of the Lord is with them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts. And this was a story about the vessels that were in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem that they would not come to Babylon, that they would stay in the house of the Lord. You know, in other words, they were to take that burden up and intercede. And then in Ezekiel 2, 9 and 10, it says, Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. You know, uh, when, when prophets begin to really have the heart of the Lord, not just the word, but the heart, oftentimes that intercession can be travail. It can be, uh, it can be heavy uh, intercession or prophetic inter and prophetic intercession because of what is not just what God is saying, but where is his heart? And 10, uh, prophets are revealers of the mysteries of God. In Ephesians 3, 4, and 5, it says, By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. God reveals mysteries. And, you know, we are living in present truth. You know, the word does not change. The Bible does not change. And we don't add, we don't take away. But let me tell you, we have not gotten full revelation yet of all that is in that book. You see, Ephesians uh, 4.11 uh, through 17 has always been in the combined book of the Bible. But it was only in the timing of God that those words became alive about the apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and, and evangelists as God was bringing restorational moves to his body. And I could talk a long time about the restorational moves of God and how each uh, each thing as we came out of the dark ages, how God had a plan to restore all of these things back into his church. But he has uh, mysteries that are being revealed in his word, the rhema word of God and the logos word coming together and God brings revelation and insight Number 11, prophets do battle with Jezebel, divination, strongholds, Baal. You know, it is a warfare ministry. And when a prophet is operating in their authority and in the sphere of authority that God has reckoned unto them, then they can say, as Elijah did in 1 Kings 18, 19, Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And they do war with those, with those prophets, I mean, with those false prophets. Not in the natural, in the spirit. They can confront in the natural too, though. Number 12, they speak to nations and kingdoms. Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I knew, formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. You know, it is amazing how God has used prophets 
and still does. Let me tell you, he still does use prophets to uh, leaders of nations. It, it happens they uh, are, he will send. And listen, don't think that it, it couldn't be you. Don't think it couldn't be you that he wants to send to go speak to a leader of influence or someone in a position that you may think, well, I have no idea how, those, how I would ever, uh, you know, be sent to give a word like that or a word to that person. Um, I mean, it's, it, God is able God is able. And, I mean, it'll blow your mind sometimes how he can do what he does. I know just last year it was. God opened the door for me to have a three-hour private lunch with the president of a nation to give him the word of the Lord in Washington, D.C. He can do that. He can open the door for it to happen. And you, you don't, you just be obedient. But God has called us to have words for nations, words to release, words to, to uh, direct, words to God. I remember the first time I went before a president of a nation. And we had gone and Life Center had sent a team to the Philippines. And we had gone with uh, uh, our spiritual granddad, Dr. Bill Hammond, and we were his team. And uh, we were uh, ministering at a gathering in the Philippines to introduce and pioneer the prophetic. And Dr. Mary, we had 4,000 uh, pastors and leaders in the uh, conference center, and one of the apostles in the Philippines had arranged for a private uh, meeting with the president-elect that was coming into office in the Philippines. And so uh, Dr. Mary stayed, and she handled the 4,000 leaders and pastors, and I and Prophet Pat Fraley and a couple of other people went with Bishop Hammond to go prophesy over this president-elect. And I remember he had asked us, you know, did we have anything? We prayed. We we all contributed what the Lord gave us. But I remember how specific the directives were. He said, do not sell your land to foreigners. For there are many nations coming in and wanting to buy up your land. Do not send. And put your money into the power grid and into telecommunications. Because God wants to bring industry. He said, I've called you to be the head and not the tail. And he said, and I forget the exact time frame. But he said, and within a certain period of time, your national debt will be wiped out. And it was just a short time within months that Shell Oil had been drilling off the coast of the Philippines. And they had been um, looking for this like aquifer of oil that was underneath the, the shell of the uh, seafloor, seafloor. And it kept moving. And they had been trying to get it for 10 years. I mean, they just... They kept trying, they'd move, they'd, they'd go with it, and all of that, they never got it. So finally, they just made a corporate decision to abandon this drilling rig uh, and turn it over to the Filipino government. And as soon as they did, they struck the oil. And it wiped out 85% of their national debt like that. I mean, God... God 
has words and and insight and revelation for nations and we're called as a prophetic people as prophets as those who have a, a prophetic gifting uh, we are called to rise to a level now you may be at a level where you're just learning you may be at a level where you have the gift of prophecy but let me tell you there's more for you God has more for you and if you're called to the office of the prophet I just want to challenge you. It's time to arise. It's time to rise up to a new level and not be uh, complacent and not be happy with the status quo. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. And if I could have Mario... And maybe even in a few minutes, just the team would be great. Wasn't that a wonderful song? Can, can you tell how much that song was in alignment with that higher place that he wants us to see? It's so, God is, God is moving us. So right now, let's just extend our hands and get into a receive mode. Father, I thank you that your voice shakes the cedars, that it, it shakes the mountains of Lebanon. It shakes the, the tides of the ocean, and it controls the movement of the seas. I thank you, Father, that you created all things and that it all belongs to you, Father. And so, God, tonight, I pray for all of us to move to a higher level, to move to a higher dimension, to be able to see, I pray, Father, open our spiritual eyes that we may see open our spiritual ears that we may see in the new realm that you have for us. Lift us higher, Holy Spirit. Tune our ears to the frequency of heaven. We break down every argument against you. We break all unworthiness and we declare that you are sovereign and you are King and Lord. So, Father, anoint the fruit of our lips. Cause us to be in a new dimension. Cause us to hear you at a new level. And let us go boldly into the new as you are lifted high, Jesus. Captain of the host, we follow after you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, just impart a higher level. I just want to, if you are ordained or you know that you are a prophet, I want you to come stand up here at the altar. Father, I thank you for causing us to rise to that new place. And Lord, I pray 
that even as we lay hands on these, that there would be a release of anointing and impartation to that new level. Forgive us for not speaking. Forgive us for not seeking. And lift us into that higher place. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Now I'm just going to come and, and lay hands. I don't know if we have any men that might be able to help and just stand behind. You can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not expecting, but I'm not foolish either.
Hallelujah. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, just hold your hands up here. Those of you online, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just impart the release of the new level now in Jesus' name. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, those that hear, those that desire to hear and to see, Release the seers, Lord. Release the seers. Release the mysteries, God. Release the mysteries. Release your hand, Father, upon your prophets and prophetic people. Release it now, Lord. Release the intercessors. God, let Jesus be lifted high and glorified in all things. We love you, we bless you, and we give you honor and glory. Let your peace prevail, Jesus. Prince of peace, fill every heart with your peace. And cause us to go boldly into these new dimensions, these new places that you desire to show us. And we will follow after you wherever you lead. If you agree with that, would you say amen, Lord? And just say, if you receive the impartations and the releasing tonight, just say, I receive it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Apostle James, can I lay hands on you? Can we have? has so much that he and and there's so much in your heart and he so wants to it's like there's a whole new dimension that's going to bring it all together it's going to come together God says I'm going to show it to you I'm going to show you you're going to see you're going to see you're going to write you're going to see you're going to write you're going to see you're going to write you're going to demonstrate you're going to bring it forth and God says I I deposited it in you and now I'm bringing you up that you might see what I have given and God says that this This is a time where I am stirring even within you uh, my spirit of creativity. And God says it's been dormant for a season. But the Lord says tonight I am activating it to a new dimension. I'm activating it to a new level. For there is much in my kingdom that is in your heart and in your spirit that has yet to be released. So the Lord says get ready my son for this is the season that you have have been waiting for. Jesus, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. God, we thank you for what you are doing, what you have done, what you will do, even through what you've done tonight. And God, we give you honor and praise. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. And we just, Lord, we're overwhelmed by who you are. In Jesus' name, God bless you, love you. Go boldly and prophets arise. Yes.